Well, I brought with me this morning a little chocolate Easter bunny. Um, I, I don't know. I, maybe you've received one of these when you were a kid, or maybe you've given one as a parent. I just want to say if you've received one as a kid, I'm sorry. If you've given one as a parent, shame on you. Kind of joking, not really. I, so I grew up in Western PA, and there's a place called Daffin's Candies. My friends over here know about it. If you ever go out there, you got to go there. It's the greatest chocolate in the world. If I got one of these, I was disappointed because we know what this is. You know, the box says it's a foot tall. whoop de doo It's got a bow tie. It's got colors. It's pretty, but we know what it is, right? It's hollow. It's empty. It's brittle. And quite honestly, it's pretty disgusting. If we're... If we're honest, isn't that a depiction of life sometimes? Sometimes hollow, a little brittle. If we're honest, maybe a little disgusting. Maybe you feel that way this morning. Maybe we're singing all these songs and we're celebrating. You're like, life doesn't feel that way. It feels like that nasty Easter money. And I want to say, if you feel that way, you are in good company, at least in that first Easter morning. Because the women who went to the tomb Easter Sunday had the same perspective of life. It was pretty hollow. It was brittle. It was kind of disgusting. We're told that as the women went to the tomb, actually Luke gives us this account of Jesus' life. On Friday he dies. The women go to prepare spices and perfumes it rolls into Saturday, Sabbath, so they can't work. Based on their tradition and some of their policies, they couldn't work, so they wait. And you get the idea that as soon as the sun comes up on Sunday morning, they go to the tomb. In fact, that's what Luke writes. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. And what they bring with them indicates that they had no expectation of finding life. They had every expectation of finding death that morning. And the reason for the spices and the perfumes was to mask death, to cover it over, to at least mitigate the disgusting reality of it for as long as they possibly could and as much as they could afford. And isn't that how we approach life too often? Where instead of actually finding life, we try to cover up With as much makeup, a nice suit, spices and perfumes, we try to cover up. But the truth is, in time, the disgusting reality, the stench of death reveals itself. You think about that weekend. It was a weekend of celebration. People were in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was a festival. Festivals are parties. And in that party there's a crucifixion occurring. In the midst of people celebrating deliverance, darkness is actually taking its place. And listen, if we do not have Easter, that's all we're left with. If, just like Caleb and Pete said, if Jesus is dead, we had another charismatic leader who showed up, who died, and life went on, and quite frankly, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be talking about it. But when the women went expecting to find death, God was expecting to do something bigger. We find from Luke's account what they hoped to see or what they did see. He says they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. Notice that at no point in the process do they actually think there's life. They see the stone rolled away. They don't think, well, he must be alive. They still go in and anticipate to find a body. Even as the angels show up, they they don't quite get it. They're not looking for life. They went there looking for death. It's why the question that the angels ask becomes so much more significant 
Did you catch their question? The angels say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? They weren't looking for the living. And their question indicates that their start was wrong. Their pursuit was wrong. They weren't looking for life. They knew who they were looking for, but they didn't know who he truly was. Jesus had made many statements about life. Jesus one time was sitting with a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. She's half Jewish. Based on their structure, based on their culture, some of the prejudice that exists, usually Jewish men did not speak to Samaritan men or Samaritan women. So Jesus is sitting with her, and he says to her, can you get me a drink? She's shocked by that, so she stirs up a conversation. The fact that he's even talking to her, she stirs up a conversation. And in that conversation, Jesus says this, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Now, all she can see is physical, material. And isn't that when we're looking for life, we think it's material? Too often, I think that we pursue life and we think life is found in an experience or a thing I can purchase. And her mind is solely on material. She says, you don't have a bucket. How are you going to get me water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who dug this well? And Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks from that water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact... The water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Jesus says it's not something outside of you, something external that you could work to achieve. I will bring about some life inside of you that springs out of you to other people. It's life from within springing forth. He's offering her something bigger. Another occasion, Jesus saw the crowds were following him. And he realized that they were following him because he multiplied bread and fed them. He was a meal ticket. So he says to them, search for food that doesn't perish rather than food that perishes. So they start asking, well, where's this food? Again, material, physical. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. This is the will of him who sent me. That I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus was speaking of real security. If you believe in me, Jesus said, if you put your trust in me, whatever happens, I will raise you up. Nothing will keep you down. Nothing will destroy you. You will never be lost. He will hold you until the end. He was speaking of real life. Jesus would declare that God is a God of the living, not the dead. So when the angels say, why are you looking for the living? Jesus once was speaking to the religious leaders, and there was a group, many, many Jewish men and women believe in the resurrection, believe in a resurrection, there was a group called the Sadducees who didn't. And so they began asking Jesus questions to try to trap him. And understanding their perspective, he says to them, so in essence, you don't believe in a resurrection, but God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His wording indicates that he is, not was, meaning he is the God of the living, not the dead. And Jesus would say to Martha after she lost her brother Lazarus, he would say to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Jesus is life. So these women knew who they were looking for, but did they know who he was truly? That he was life. They weren't even looking for life. They were looking to find death. They thought that's what they would find. And what they found that morning was life. They needed to be reminded, and I think we need to be reminded as well. The angels say to them, he is not here. He is risen. If you're looking for life, can I tell you it's not found in a bottle? It's not found in your work? 
It's not found in your achievements or your relationships or anything else. It is found in him. So when the angels say, you're looking for life, it's not here because he's not here. Jesus is life. He's not here. He is risen. Remember. Remember how he spoke to you when he, he was still in Galilee saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and, ri- crucified and rise on the third day. Why was it necessary? Because if Jesus did not pay that penalty of death, you and I will st- would still owe it. And if Easter did not happen, his claims of life would be meaningless. His offer to you and I of eternal life and entry into the kingdom would be meaningless because he could not carry it out for himself. But because he lives, he can verify that he could give us entry into the kingdom of heaven. He stands as our advocate. He must so that we could. The angels call them to remember the resurrection proclaims to us us life and freedom from dressed up tombs. We don't have to live in the hollowness and brokenness and the graveyards of our world. We can live in life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. That wasn't quantity. Every human being will live eternally. What Jesus was offering was life in quality. That through him we could have a quality of life that's restored to our Father in heaven and we can live in quality of life now. Not that everything is perfect, but that we know life and we know that no matter what happens, we will be risen. We will stand. We don't have to live in the misery. My burden for myself and for so many who believe this truth, we continue to live as empty tombs graveyards. Resurrection declares that life should no longer be something we endlessly chase in the graveyards of of the external. The resurrection declares that life should come from within us and spring forth from us to others. Here's what I recognize and what I think the angels are declaring. When we look for Jesus, we find life. My question for you, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, when people come looking for you, what do they find? Do they find a graveyard? Do they find a dressed up tomb? Or do they find a spring that is springing forth the life of Jesus Christ, that is screaming, declaring, spilling out the life of Jesus Christ because that's the life that's in us. Jesus said, I'm not giving you an external life. I'm putting life inside of you, a well springing forth to eternal abundant life. What I see in this is that it calls us to truly live. And I'm not saying that there's not brokenness and there's not pain and there's not hurt. But because Jesus lives, we can say like the Apostle Paul said, we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but we will never be destroyed. Because death couldn't hold our Lord, and it can't hold us either. So let's live. And be life to those who are around us. Let's be springs of living water, not dressed up tombs, not hollow bunnies. Let's live. If we put our faith in him, let's spring forth the life of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for this day and what it represents. I thank you that the very thing that clouds over each and every one of us, you have overcome. And you have declared to us that if we believe in you, we will live even if we die. Nothing will keep us down. You will not lose a single one of us. You will raise us on the last day. And you could say that with confidence because you rose from the grave. Father, I pray that we would live as springs of life, not dressed up tombs. We would not be empty, hollow, brittle, that we would be full and abundant 
because of what you have done and what you are doing within us. But I thank you and praise you this morning. We celebrate the life that you offer through your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. You know, in his story, there were a lot of different perspectives. It says that when the women came to the tomb, they were perplexed. They were confused. Later goes on, Luke writes that they went and ran and told the disciples. And when the disciples heard, the disciples thought their words were nonsense and did not believe them. But then Peter and also John got up and they ran to the tomb, I think, to see if what what the women were actually saying was true. And it says that Peter left in wonder or amazement. And maybe you're somewhere in there. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just confused. I don't get what's happening. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're sort of in wonder, you're curious, but you still have a lot of questions, you need a lot of answers. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, this is nonsense, don't buy it. We just want to say we're glad you're looking. Because we believe that whoever looks for Jesus will find life. But what we believe as a church is that there was a man who said he would live and die and come back to life, and he is alive today, and it is that Lord and that Savior that we celebrate. So why don't you stand with us as we close the service and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ?